Ever wondered how the world would have been if a certain Archduke had stayed at home for a sandwich instead of going out for a ride in 1914? Well, pull up a chair, history buffs and sandwich enthusiasts alike, our tale begins with Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, whose fateful detour for a spin in a convertible would trigger a catastrophic chain of events. Picture this. The early 20th century, a time of burgeoning national ego and a spiderweb of alliances, each thread tenser than the last. The world was a powder keg just waiting for a spark. That spark? It was none other than the assassination of our dear Archduke. His untimely demise set in motion the wheels of a war machine that would engulf nations far and wide. The alliances, once the safety nets of nations, became the chains that dragged them into the abyss of conflict. So, the world was set. All it needed was a spark, and boy, did that spark come in the form of a bullet. Imagine a row of dominoes lined up. Now picture one domino falling and the rest following suit. That's World War I for you. Let's kick off with the first domino, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. A young Serbian nationalist, Gavrilo Princip, not exactly a fan of Austria-Hungary, decided to express his feelings in the most dramatic way possible, by assassinating the heir to the throne. Now Austria-Hungary, understandably miffed, declares war on Serbia. The next domino teeters. Russia, ever the big brother, decides it's time to step in and support Serbia. Serbia is thrilled, of course. Austria-Hungary, not so much. So they call up their buddy Germany for some moral and military support. Germany, always ready for a good rumble, declares war on Russia. Meanwhile, France is watching from the sidelines munching on some popcorn. They see their ally Russia getting into a fight and decide they can't just sit back and enjoy the show. So, they join the fray, prompting Germany to declare war on France too. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Germany, eager to get to France decides to march through neutral Belgium. Great plan except for one tiny detail, Britain had promised to protect Belgium. So Britain declares war on Germany and Austria-Hungary. Now, I know what you're thinking. What about Italy? Well, Italy was initially part of the Central Powers with Germany and Austria-Hungary. But looking at the way the dominoes were falling, they decided to switch sides and join the Allies. Talk about a plot twist. And that's how, in the blink of an eye, a single assassination spiraled into a full-blown war involving multiple nations. The dominoes kept falling one after the other, pulled into the vortex of conflict by a complex web of alliances and obligations, not to mention a fair bit of old-fashioned rivalry and ambition. And just like that in a flurry of declarations and alliances, the world found itself at war. Ever been stuck in a stalemate? Well imagine that, but with trenches, barbed wire and constant artillery fire. Welcome to the Western Front of World War I folks, where the term stuck in the mud took on a whole new, terrifying meaning. This was the epicenter of a grim game of tug-of-war, with neither side gaining significant ground for years. Now let's talk about the trenches. These weren't your average backyard holes. Picture a zigzagging network of narrow, muddy pathways, stretching from the English Channel all the way to the Swiss border. Makes your morning commute seem like a stroll in the park, doesn't it? And it wasn't just a case of watch your step or you'll trip, it was watch your step or you'll land in a pool of water, mud and who knows what else. They didn't exactly have five-star sanitation back then, but let's move on to a more explosive topic, the Battle of the Somme. This wasn't just any battle, folks. This was one of the bloodiest battles in human history. It had everything, a grand plan, high hopes, and a sobering reality. The first day alone saw the British Army suffer more than 57,000 casualties. That's like wiping out an entire football stadium in a day. Talk about a tough day at the office. And let's not forget the role of new warfare technology. This was the first industrial-scale war, and it brought with it all sorts of terrifying innovations. Tanks made their battlefield debut, and they were like nothing anyone had seen before. And then there were machine guns, poison gas, airplanes, it was a veritable supermarket of destruction. But amidst all this chaos and horror, there were moments of humanity too, stories of Christmas truces, of soldiers playing football in no man's land, of small acts of kindness amidst the carnage. Because even in the midst of the worst of times, the human spirit finds a way to shine through. So next time you're stuck in traffic, remember, it could be worse. You could be in a trench. Meanwhile, on the Eastern Front, things were different. Now imagine a chess game, but instead of a polished mahogany board, it's a vast, unwieldy expanse of land. And instead of chess pieces, there are armies and nations vying for control. That, in a nutshell, was the Eastern Front. Here, the key players were Russia and the Central Powers, namely Germany, 
Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. But if you're thinking this was a straightforward orderly affair, well, you'd be as wrong as a pineapple on a pizza. The Eastern Front was as chaotic as a supermarket on Black Friday. The Russian army, bless their hearts, were like a man trying to win a swimming race while wearing a suit of armor. They had the numbers, sure, but they were woefully under-equipped. It was like bringing a knife to a gunfight, except the knife was a spoon, and the gun was a tank. On the other hand, the Central Powers were like the cool kids at school. They had the gear, the strategy, and the fancy mustaches, but the vastness of the Eastern Front was a tough nut to crack. It was like trying to find a needle in a haystack, if the haystack was the size of, well, Russia. As the war dragged on, it was like a game of tug of war with both sides pulling with all their might. There were victories, losses, and endless stalemates. It was a roller coaster ride, except the roller coaster was on fire, and there was no end in sight. Eventually, Russia had to throw in the towel, leading to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in March of 1918. This effectively ended their involvement in the war, but not before they'd lost a staggering amount of territory. It was like losing at Monopoly, but instead of properties, you're losing actual countries. So, the Eastern Front was a whole different ballgame, but equally as chaotic. All good or bad things must come to an end, and World War I was no exception. The year was 1917. Enter stage left the United States, fashionably late to the fight as usual. They'd been sitting on the sidelines, but then Germany sent a telegram to Mexico suggesting they team up and take on the US. It was kind of like passing a note in class but instead of asking if someone likes you it's asking if they want to start a war. Smooth move Germany real smooth. Meanwhile over in Russia the people were having a bit of a revolution. The Russian Empire was out, and the Soviet Union was in. They'd had enough of the war and were ready to focus on their own problems. So they signed a peace treaty with Germany, effectively saying, you guys go ahead and finish this one without us. We've got a workers' paradise to build. Now back to the Western Front. Germany was really feeling the squeeze. The US was throwing its weight around and the Central Powers were falling like dominoes. Germany requested an armistice, a fancy word for time out, and on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the guns fell silent. The leaders of the warring nations then gathered in Versailles to sign a peace treaty. They made Germany take the blame for the war and pay massive reparations. It was like when you break a vase at your friend's house, and they not only make you pay for it but also for their new car, just because. And just like that, the war to end all wars was over. Or so they thought. So what happens after the world has been at war? Well, for starters there was a massive game of who gets what going on. Borders were redrawn faster than a toddler with a crayon could manage. Some countries vanished completely, while others popped into existence like magic. I guess it's like an intense game of Monopoly, except with actual lands and nations. Then comes the formation of the League of Nations. Picture this, a group of countries getting together, promising to play nice and never start a world war again. Spoiler alert, they didn't stick to that promise for too long. And of course the seeds of another conflict were sown. In a twist that no one saw coming, the peace treaty that ended the First World War ended up setting the stage for the second, there's a sense of irony for you. And there you have it folks, World War I, a mix of alliances, stalemates and a whole lot of confusion. But hey, at least we got some new countries out of it.